Hi everyone, it's Duchess. Amidst the tranquility of spring break 2024, I found solace in my bed in the aftermath of midterms behind me, engrossed in the captivating world of Chrono Trigger on my laptop. As I dove deeper into the game, seeking to uncover its many endings, a message arrived. The news of Akira Toriyama's passing at the age of 68. Known as the creative genius behind Dragon Ball Z and the artistic vision behind acclaimed titles like Dragon Quest and Chrono Trigger, Toriyama's influence on the gaming and anime landscape was immense. While my channel typically focuses on strictly gaming content, I felt compelled to take a departure from the norm, if only briefly, to pay tribute to Toriyama's unparalleled legacy. In this video, I'll delve into my fondest memories of playing Dragon Ball games, reflecting on the impact they've had on my gaming journey, and celebrating the enduring artistry of Toriyama's work. I'm beginning with what I consider the pinnacle of Dragon Ball gaming experiences, Budokai Tenkaichi 2. Now, I'm fully aware that this stance might raise a few eyebrows, given the widespread acclaim placed upon its successor, Budokai Tenkaichi 3, celebrated for its expansive roster of playable characters. I'll give credit where it's due. Budokai Tenkaichi 3's character selection is unmatched to this day. However, my perspective is shaped by personal nostalgia and fond memories. You see, while I never had the chance to immerse myself in the world of Budokai Tenkaichi 3 during my formative gaming years, Budokai Tenkaichi 2 holds a special place in my heart. It was a game that consumed countless hours of my time, particularly during one unforgettable summer when I was just 11 or 12 years old. One of Budokai Tenkaichi's 2's standout features is his compelling story mode. While admittedly the overall narrative still broadly follows the familiar Dragon Ball Z arcs like the Saiyan Saga, Cell Games, and Majin Buu chapters, the game sets itself apart through brilliant what-if storylines that reimagine events in entertainingly novel ways. I vividly recall playing through one particularly memorable scenario on a sunny early summer day as a young fan. It ingenuously recontextualized the Raditz encounter by portraying him not as Goku's villainous brother, but rather an unlikely hero joining the Z Fighters. Such an intriguing narrative twist sparked my imagination, honestly planting the seeds for my later deep dive into Dragon Ball fanfiction during my preteen and teen years. Budokai Tenkaichi 2's story mode dared to ask tantalizing what-if questions that made me ponder alternate takes on Toriyama's established lore. For cultivating that sense of speculative intrigue alongside faithfully retelling the anime's iconic events, Budokai Tenkaichi 2 stands out with arguably the most engaging and meaningful story mode experiences within the Dragon Ball gaming pantheon. Discussing Budokai Tenkaichi 2 will be incomplete without acknowledging its extraordinarily evocative soundtrack. There's an undefinable quality to this game's compositions that fills me with overwhelming peace and contentment. The calming atmospheric tracks transport me to idyllic scenes, enjoying a picnic in warm sunshine or watching the sunsets glow over a pristine beach. An unusual reaction, perhaps, for a rambunctious Dragon Ball fighting game score. Yet Budokai Tenkaichi 2's music has that uplifting power to elevate my emotional state whenever those familiar notes begin to play. I'm instantly taken back to a state of pure, undistracted bliss. Never has a game's soundtrack so effortlessly captured the essence of carefree happiness and harmony in my experiences. For that invaluable ability to soothe the spirit, Budokai Tenkaichi 2's inspired compositions represent its most underrated legacy. To be fully transparent, I'm well aware that this retrospective is perhaps painting an overly rosy picture by overlooking many of Budokai Tenkaichi 2's flaws. It's far from a perfect game, and revisiting today highlights its aging visuals and somewhat janky control inputs representative of its era. However, None of these technical shortcomings can diminish the invaluable role Budokai Tenkaichi 2 played in shaping my childhood gaming memories. When the school break summers arrived, this was the title my brother and I played incessantly. The Dragon Ball action, making those useful days of freedom all the more electrifying. While I can objectively recognize its faults, I'll forever associate Budokai Tenkaichi 2 with an irreplaceable sense of wonder and joy that transcends any technical critique. Those nostalgic emotional connections forged across countless summer holidays imbues this game with a permanent sense of importance in my life. Its imperfections pale in comparison to the invaluable communal experiences it provided. 
Dragon Ball Z Ultimate Tenkaichi represents a conflicting entry that both epitomized my hopes for the franchise's gaming potential, while also failing to fully live up to those lofty expectations. Upon its original release, the prospect of being able to craft my own custom warrior within the Dragon Ball universe ignited tremendous excitement. Finally, Bandai Namco was embracing an interactive Dragon Ball Z experience not solely centered around predetermined heroes like Goku or Vegeta. Ultimate Tenkaichi's Hero Mode allowed me to insert my created character into an original story campaign which, from my recollection, involved battling an evil Shenron in a narrative seemingly inspired by Dragon Ball GT's darker storytelling turn. While not particularly memorable from a storytelling perspective, Hero Mode's ambition hint at bigger things on the horizon for fan-driven adventures. Ultimate Tenkaichi planted crucial seeds that will blossom into the beloved Xenoverse games finally fulfilling that dream. However, this experimentation came at the cost of a lacking character roster and repetitive combat, leaving much to be desired. For every ingenious new system it introduced, there were inherent flaws, reminding me this was still an imperfect stepping stone towards Bandai's true realization of a customizable, interactive Dragon Ball experience. Akin to his predecessor, one of Ultimate Tenkaichi's most redeeming qualities was his phenomenal soundtrack that could have served as the primary selling point. The audio direction diverged considerably from Budokai Tenkaichi 2's synthesized cutting-edge compositions. Ultimate Tenkaichi's music favored a grittier, more grounded rock aesthetic, anchored by grungy electric guitar riffs conveying that brooding warrior ambience. This tonal shift made sense given the respective eras. Budokai Tenkaichi 2 represented the boundary-pushing heights the Budokai series could achieve on powerhouse PS2 hardware. In contrast, Ultimate Tenkaichi embraced a grimier, more grounded audio personality reflective of changing taste and production realities during the dawn of the 7th console generation. While the soundtracks contrasted stylistically, they shared an innate ability to immerse players within their distinct interpretations of the Dragon Ball universe. Whereas Budokai Tenkaichi 2's music soared with transcendent spectacle, Ultimate Tenkaichi's score doubled down on visceral intensity, befitting the game's differing artistic visions. Regardless of preferences, both represented high watermarks for elevating Dragon Ball's interactivity through ingenious acoustic worldbuilding. While Ultimate Tenkaichi pioneered exciting new concepts for interactive Dragon Ball Z experiences, it unfortunately could not overcome crippling execution issues that marred the overall experience. Chief among his flaws was a limited character selection for versus modes that paled tremendously in comparison to his Budokai Tenkaichi predecessors. Though one could rationalize that roster constraints have increasingly become an industry norm while purchasing additional DLC fighters is the new standard. Far more detrimental, however, were Ultimate Tenkaichi's fundamentally repetitive and one-dimensional gameplay systems anchored almost entirely around tedious quick-time events and mindless button-matching sequences. Any initial enjoyment quickly gave way to hand cramps, and dwindling sanity as fights devolved into simplistic tests of endurance rather than skill or strategy. The lack of combat depth rapidly exposed Ultimate Tenkaichi's shallow core that only became more glaring as the game artificially ramped up difficulty spikes through sheer attrition. These issues completely undercut the game's pioneering ambitions like the innovative custom character creator by reducing the experience to an exercise in dull repetition rather than embodying the kinetic thrills of high-stakes Dragon Ball action. For every inspired new system Ultimate Tenkaichi introduced, it took two steps back through flawed implementation that stripped away the very essence of what makes the anime's battles so electrifying in the first place. Last but not least is what I believe to be the worst Dragon Ball game I've ever played, Budokai 1. When the Budokai HD remaster was released, my parents gifted it to me one Christmas. Although I was already well versed in the Dragon Ball gaming landscape by that point, I knew I was venturing into uncharted territory. Nonetheless, I approached it with an open mind. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't bring myself to play beyond the two-hour mark. The game was riddled with too many flaws, making it an unbearable experience for me to continue. The first thing that truly irked me was the awkward controls. While I understand that I was playing a subpar remaster of an old game, and weird controls are an inherent issue, the way everything felt and moved was extraordinarily uncomfortable for me. I vividly recall struggling through most battles in the Saiyan Saga having to restart repeatedly. 
Moreover, the character movesets were simply incorrect. I distinctly remember playing as Kid Gohan at one point, and inexplicably he could perform the Kamehameha wave, which he never used until his teenage years during the Cell Saga. Additionally, if my memory serves me correct, the Kamehameha appeared more yellow than blue. Later on, I discovered that the HD remaster itself was not particularly well executed, which likely contributed to my dreadful experience. Evidently, not many meaningful improvements were made to the games, and the original soundtrack was replaced with a new one due to copyright issues. Perhaps these factors were the very reasons that ultimately led me to harbor such a deep disdain for Budokai 1. Regardless, I abandoned playing Budokai 1 in the entire HD remaster, keeping it solely for the purpose of expanding my gaming collection. The fact of the matter was that I lacked the sentimental attachment to Budokai 1 that others seemed to possess, perhaps because I was too young to truly appreciate it when it was released. I did not grow up with it, so it holds no nostalgic value for me. While I can certainly appreciate its significance as the precursor to the Budokai Tenkaishi games, that is the extent of my regard for it. Beyond that, I cannot discern any truly redeeming qualities in that game. In conclusion, Akira Toriyama's passing represents the end of an era and a tremendous loss for fans worldwide. However, his enduring artistic legacy lives on through the beloved Dragon Ball games that have shaped the childhoods and nostalgic memories of countless players. While titles like Budokai Tenkaishi 2 and Ultimate Tenkaishi had their flaws, they captured the essence of Dragon Ball's kinetic action and pioneered new frontiers for interactive fan experiences. Toriyama's iconic universe will undoubtedly continue inspiring future generations of games that build upon his imaginative foundations. Even lackluster entries like the Budokai 1 remaster cannot diminish the indelible impact Dragon Ball gaming has had on millions. As we bid farewell to the creator's genius, we can take solace in the vast worlds and remembrances his works have etched into our lives forevermore. Toriyama's spirit will live eternally through the sparking energy and passion exuded by the Dragon Ball community he helped cultivate. And that's my take on this. Thank you for watching the video. If you're someone who loves exploring the deaths of the gaming community, hit that subscribe button below and turn on notifications by clicking the bell icon. See you guys later.